Good evening. I'm Amy Davenport. I'm the principal at Westwood High School. Before we get started, there are a few people that I really want to thank for helping us to make this program possible. The first are our partners in town, Westwood Youth and Family Services, who generously supported funding this event. I'd also like to thank the Norfolk County DA's office for um, their generous grant cycle that allowed us to provide this program this evening. Finally, I want to thank Westwood Media Center who will be recording today's event and posting it so that other parents and guardians who weren't able to join us will be able to access this resource. Now I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Ellie Leibowitz. Um, Dr. Leibowitz studies and treats childhood and adolescent anxiety um, at the Yale School of Medicine and is director of the Program for Anxiety Disorders at the Yale Study Center, Child Study Center. His work focuses on the development, neurobiology, and treatment of anxiety and related disorders. And we were lucky enough to have Dr. Leibowitz join us um, a few weeks ago for professional development for our staff, where we learned a lot about how to support anxious students at school. The focus of today's uh, programming is about how to support anxious students and their families at home. Um, and without further ado, Ellie, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be able to talk with all of you um, this evening on this topic of <laughs> child anxiety. And, you know, even, even in the best of times, anxiety problems and anxiety disorders are the most common mental health challenges, struggles, and problems that children cope with incredibly prevalent. I'll talk just a little bit about the prevalence, but these are really uh, problems that are very common. But let's face it, we have not been living through the best of times. These have been a couple of years that seem almost engineered to increase anxiety in children and in adults. Years that have been characterized by unpredictability, by changes, um, by loss, and um, by a sense of lack of control. And those are some of the words that are maybe most relevant to thinking about anxiety, things like changes, things like loss, things like the sense of not being in control, being um, living through a rapid change, a disruption to familiar routines, all of this is um, really a, a cocktail that is potent in elevating and exacerbating anxiety in youth. And so it's not surprising that over this period, we've seen an even further increase in need for help for children with anxiety. In our own center at Yale, we've seen uh, approximately a 100% increase um, relative to the period prior, before the, I can't say year over year anymore because we're it's more than a year into the pandemic, but really staggering numbers, both in the outpatient setting and in the EDs as well, with children presenting with um, behavioral and psychological problems often stemming from anxiety. And so it really is a time when it's so important to think about how we can support, how we can help, and how to really approach the issue of child anxiety. And for parents, an anxious child presents endless dilemmas and questions and challenges that play out through thousands of little moments throughout daily life. And so what I'm hoping is that through this encounter this, this evening, we'll be able to um, understand a little bit better the issue of child anxiety, understand how it manifests and what it looks like, but also how parents can really be helpful to children in coping with anxiety. So I'm going to bring up some slides that we can follow uh, along with as, as we go through this. Um, here, hopefully, hopefully people can see that. Yeah, I see I'm not. Okay, good. Uh, and I, and I, I, I wrote um, parent-based treatment because that is a big focus of my work and a lot of the tools that we'll be talking about come from parent-based therapy. However, I also want to emphasize that these tools can be used outside of a formal therapy as well. In other words, even when a child isn't 
actually in treatment. Maybe there isn't somebody providing regular clinical care. My hope is that the tools that we'll talk about can also be implemented outside of that setting as well, so that you have tools to better approach this issue with, with um, children in your own lives. So let's talk a little bit about anxiety first, and then about what we can do to be helpful. And uh, I'll say first that what, what you see on the screen now, these are really the common anxiety disorders that we're often uh, diagnosing and that we see commonly in children. And I'm not going to give all of the specific diagnostic criteria, but I, I'll, I'll say just a couple of words on each because uh, you may recognize some of it in uh, a child in, in your life. And starting at the top, we have our phobias. And phobias, as many probably already know, refer to exaggerated, strong, and irrational fears that could be fears of anything, but tend to be uh, focused on, on some things more than others. And so some common phobias include things like fears of the dark, fears of heights, fears of animals, both big and small. So you could have fears of uh, dogs, but also of bugs, snakes, um, and uh, needles, shots, things like that. And so these are these these tend to be things that have had some evolutionary impact on our survival over millennia. And so they, they tend to be more commonly the focus of a child's phobia. But the really important thing to note about phobias is that. Even though a phobia is technically a narrowly defined condition because you're, you're afraid of that one particular situation, they can actually lead to a tremendous amount of impairment that plays out across much broader uh, sets of domains in a child's life. And so, for example, a child who's afraid of snakes may not only avoid actually encountering snakes, they may also be afraid of just being outside, being in a park, for example, um, or, or going on a walk, because what if I were to see a snake? And they may not be able to read a, a book, because what if there's a snake in it? Or watch TV, because what if there's a snake in it? Or hear people talking about snakes, and so you end up with impairment that is much broader. And then next on this list is uh, panic disorder. Panic disorder is really characterized by having panic attacks. And panic attacks are intensely uncomfortable situations or, or experiences where it feels almost like a wire trips in your brain. Because suddenly, often out of the blue and without a clear reason, you may find yourself awash in tremendous waves of anxiety that really crash over you, leaving you with tremendous physical arousal. So your heart's racing and you're trembling and you're sweating and you're dizzy and you're, you're panting and out of breath and also with tremendous psychological uh, anxiety. So you may have really scary thoughts like, I'm dying, this is the end, or I'm losing my mind. And it's, a, it's an extremely uncomfortable situation, which leads children to have panic disorder, which is the impairment that comes from the fear of having another panic attack. And so you may become really preoccupied with the idea that I'll have another panic attack and how awful that would be. And that can lead to a lot of impairment, both because it takes over your mind and you're thinking about it, and also because you may avoid situations where you think you might have a panic attack. And a really important thing for parents to know about panic attacks is that they're actually not dangerous for children. If you have a healthy child, they can safely have a panic attack every day. I wouldn't want them to because it's so uncomfortable, but it wouldn't pose a significant physical risk to their health. In the same way that a child can run a quick sprint and their body will be all worked up and they'll be out of breath and their heart will be racing, but you're not worried about it because you know they ran a quick sprint. So of course their body's gonna be in a state of higher arousal and that's normal. If they can quickly run, they can also safely have a panic attack. However, it feels dangerous. But for parents, it's really important to know that preventing panic attacks is not a safety measure. You don't have to prevent the panic attack because you think it's going to you know, kill them or cause them to have a heart attack. They won't. That, that's not going to happen in a healthy person. If you are a 95-year-old man with a heart condition, you may want to avoid having panic attacks. But in a healthy child, they're not really a, a, a safety concern. 
very tightly linked to panic disorder is the disorder called agoraphobia, which really is the avoidance of situations where I think I might experience some physical symptoms, and then what if I get trapped there? Or what if I'm humiliated in front of other people because of my uh, physical symptoms? And often those physical symptoms can be panic symptoms. They can also be other physical symptoms, but very the most common is that they actually are, it's the fear of having panic symptoms and not being able to escape the situation or being embarrassed by my symptoms in front of other people. This is a big contributor to children's reluctance to attend school because they often will think, what if I have like a panic attack or, or some other symptom in school and I can't just get up and leave whenever I want and other people are around and seeing me. And so I'd rather not go to school at all. And this can lead to a cycle of school refusal, um, which is of course a very serious problem that many children and many schools and parents are contending with. Generalized anxiety next on our uh, circle here is really persistent chronic worry. And the worry could be about anything. Uh, common worries, generalized anxiety disorder include things like health-related worries, financial worries, performance worries, like will I do well in school? Will I have a good future? Or worries about mistakes that I might have made or might make. And the worries are really take over your brain in a way that is simply exhausting and wearying to a child. And you know, it's, it's like having this antenna on your head that's tuned to pick up things to worry about and then to just get stuck on them so that your mind churns away with all these worries in a way that is extremely exhausting. And one of the really uh, unfortunate aspects of generalized anxiety and its worries is that for a lot of children, it's actually in those moments when they would normally be able to relax and recharge their batteries that the worries come up the most. And so maybe when a child is really focused on something, like they're doing a sport, maybe the worries are kept at bay and they're less focused on them. But then they have some time to relax, like watch a movie or go to sleep at night. All of the worries come rushing up so that they're lying there in bed, sometimes for hours and not falling asleep. This takes a real toll on a child's health because they're losing sleep and they're fatigued and their body is tense all the time because of the worry. And they often start to develop things like uh, back aches, stomach aches, headaches, or their attention starts to, la to, to flag because they're so tired. And so we end up with a really complex cascade of um, outcomes of this disorder that take a very serious toll. It also runs down your immune system because if you're chronically worried and you're not relaxed, then your immune system is also going to take a hit. And then you're more likely to develop uh, sicknesses and, and you may get worried about the sicknesses, you end up with this really big cycle of anxiety um, and worry. Social anxiety, or also known as social phobia, is an extreme preoccupation with the evaluation of other people. It's the worry that I will be judged negatively by other people. Maybe I'll make a fool of myself. Maybe I'll say the wrong thing. Maybe people will look at me uh, negatively. And this can lead to a lot of avoidance in the social sphere or the social domain so that I'm not raising my hand in class because what if I get it wrong? I'm not talking to other children because what if they don't like me? I'm not going to the sleepover or the party or the you know, school event because what if I don't know the right thing to say and nobody wants to talk to me? And so you end up with a lot of isolation very often in children with social phobia. And uh, a little ironically, they're often perceived by other children as being somewhat aloof or even snobby or standoffish because they're not interacting. When in fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's not that they think they're so much better than everybody else, but they're so worried about being judged worse than everyone else. But they can be perceived that way. And that further compounds the isolation in social phobia. And it's important to understand that children with social phobia are not disinterested in other people. Uh, in a sense, they're hyper interested in other people. But what I really mean is that they, it's not that they don't want to have friends. They may wish that they had friends, that they could get along with other people and, and, and spend time with them and interact with them. But they may put a lot of energy into avoiding the situations where they actually could make those friends or be with the people because of the anxiety. And that can lead to a lot of loneliness in children with social phobia. 
separation anxiety is, as the name suggests, the fear of being separated from your attachment figures, your caregivers, typically that is your parents. It can be a fear of something that will happen to you, the child, when your parents are away. Like maybe um, I'll get lost or maybe uh, I'll get kidnapped or things like that. It can also be the fear that something will happen to your parents when they are away. Like they'll get into a car accident and never come home. And separation anxiety can be very impairing both for the child but also for the rest of the family because it's not only that I don't want my parents to go away for a long time, it also can be that I don't want to be away even in another room from them in the same house. And so I might not close the door when I go to the bathroom, for example, because I have to make sure that I can still see my parents or talk to them where I can't sleep alone at night. And obviously this has an impact not only on the child, but also on the rest of the family. And last on this circle is OCD, which stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And um, it really is characterized by some combination of obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions in OCD are thoughts that come into your mind that you don't want to have, but you can't stop thinking about them, and they cause you distress and discomfort. So common obsessions include things like thoughts about contamination and germs, or thoughts about harm, harm that will befall me, or even harm that I will do or may have done to somebody else. Or uh, doubt is a common form of obsession, doubting that I did the thing that I know I did, but I'm still thinking about, did I do it? And compulsions in OCD are behaviors, rigidly scripted behaviors that I have to perform in just such a way, usually in order to push away the thought or in order to uh, relieve the anxiety that the thoughts, the obsessions cause. And sometimes we'll see a kind of link between the obsession and the compulsion. So for example, a child may have contamination related obsessions and they may engage in cleaning rituals like hand washing. But other times there won't be that link. A child might have obsessions about harm, like maybe I uh, hurt somebody, or maybe I told a lie, or I stole something. Or they may have obsessions um, that are sexual in nature, which are also a common theme of obsessions, even in very young children. And then they have these thoughts or images that come into their mind and cause them distress or disgust. And then they could still have a hand-washing compulsion, even though that doesn't seem to have that same kind of logical link. And children with OCD typically know that their thoughts are not really rational and that the behaviors are not really rational, but they still feel compelled to do them. Just to give you an example, I once worked with a teenager with obsessive compulsive disorder who had the obsession that he would um, lose the key to his house. And because of him doing that, somebody would find the key and break into his house and harm his family. And he was just very obsessed with this idea that he would be responsible for harming his family by losing his key. And so he had a compulsive ritual of searching for his key every time he went through a doorway. If he walked into a room or out of a room or got in the car or out of the car, he would get down on his hands and knees and search for his key to confirm that he hadn't dropped it there. And he could do that even while holding the key in his hand, meaning he totally noticed that he did not drop his key because he's literally holding it, but he still would have to perform the ritual in order to tick the box of, I searched for my key, because otherwise he would just be so tormented by these thoughts. So that is obsessive compulsive disorder. And for most of this conversation this evening, I'm going to talk about these disorders as a group rather than individually. So I'll just talk about anxiety more as, a, um, as an overall group. But I'll say one more thing about the more specific diagnoses, and that is uh, what you see here on the slide, which is a little bit of information on the ages at which we're typically going to be seeing these problems, and so, um, or, or the age at which they onset. So you can see that the earliest anxiety disorders tend to be the phobias and separation anxiety. But then as we get a little bit older, as kids get more toward puberty, we will start to see the onset of generalized anxiety disorder picking up, and then into adolescence, social anxiety disorder, and later in adolescence, panic disorder will start to appear uh, more commonly. Um, 
I mentioned at the very beginning uh, today that anxiety disorders really are the most common mental health problems. And you can see that here. Our, our current estimates are that approximately one in three children, one in three, that's so many, is going to experience a clinically diagnosable impairing anxiety disorder at some point before they reach adulthood. So those are staggering numbers. And that is, these are data from before COVID. So that, that's not even accounting for the impact of, of you know, a, a, a pandemic. And most of the uh, anxiety disorders are going to occur pretty early in life. They're going to start pretty early in life. So the median age of onset is at around age 10 or 11, meaning that half of all cases start before that. And even when it, uh, anxiety is first diagnosed in an adult, typically, if you ask that adult, when did the problem start, they will tell you that it started much earlier in life, typically in pretty early in their childhood. And anxiety disorders are also very highly co-occurring with other mental health problems. We often think about anxiety as a kind of gateway disorder because a lot of other mental health problems will be preceded by and also accompanied by anxiety. There's a lot of comorbidity within the actual anxiety disorders. What I mean by that is that when a child meets diagnostic criteria for one anxiety disorder, they're actually more likely than not to also meet criteria for another anxiety disorder. So a child who has, for example, separation anxiety may also have social anxiety or generalized anxiety or OCD. And that's going to be a, a very common story. And it's not really that this child is so unfortunate that they have so many diseases or illnesses. It's not really that these are separate problems. Actually, what they have is an anxiety problem, which is manifesting in different domains. So they might have overvigilance or a tendency to very anxious thoughts um, or dysregulated physiology, but it's manifesting in these different domains. And because we, meaning the field of mental health, because we carve up the anxiety disorders based on the main domain where it's manifesting, they end up with having more than one, uh, more than one disorder. But actually, it's more one problem than, than multiple problems. But besides the co-occurrence of the anxiety disorders, there's also a tremendous amount of comorbidity between anxiety and other mental health problems. So for example, there's a lot of comorbidity with depression. Many children with anxiety will also have depression. And very commonly, the anxiety will start first, and then the depression will ensue. There's also a lot of comorbidity with attention problems. And there's also a lot of comorbidity with substance problems, especially once we get into adolescence and the teenage years. And some of that is what you might think of as self-medication for the child, meaning that they discover that using some substance like alcohol or marijuana will help them to feel less anxious. And then they might seek out that experience again, setting off a, a, a spiral of increasing substance problems. That's a really important thing to be um, aware of, especially in, in teenagers. Now, I wanted to share a metaphor that, for me, captures some of what it's like to live with an anxiety disorder as a child, but honestly, as an adult also. It's not all that different if we're talking about adults. And this is a metaphor of a minefield, of living your life in a minefield. And many, many years ago now, I was a soldier. I was in the army. And I was in the infantry. And I did a training that you have to do, which is supposed to prepare you for how you should behave if you find yourself in a minefield. Now, the truth of the matter is, you don't need this training at all. <laughs> All you really need is a little bit of common sense and some will to live, and you're going to do those things anyway because they make sense. So what are the two main things that you'll do if you're in a minefield? One is you're going to take as few steps as possible, right? You don't take extra steps when you're in a minefield because when every step could be your last and is incredibly dangerous, it's not worth it to take a step unless you really, really, really need to. And this is 
I think it, it captures an aspect of what it's like for children who are coping with a lot of anxiety. When you live your life and it feels like you're in a minefield where every event, situations that to other people seem innocuous or seem neutral, but to you seem fraught with danger, what's, what it's going to lead to is a lot of avoidance. You don't take those extra steps. You know, uh, I live in New Haven in Connecticut and in my backyard, there is a rabbit that comes to visit us periodically. He just shows up in the yard every once in a while. And he's really sweet. And when I'm in my yard and I see the rabbit, sometimes I'll walk over closer because I want to get a better look at this cute rabbit. If I'm in a minefield and I see a rabbit, I'm not going to wander over closer to, be to get a better look because it's not worth the risk. I'm gonna wish that rabbit good luck. I'm gonna hope he makes it out of the minefield, but I'm not gonna wander over closer to get a better look. And this is how anxious children will often approach a lot of situations with the idea of it's not worth the risk. Like, you know, could I have fun if I went to the school trip? Maybe, will I go on the school trip? Definitely not, because what if? All of those what ifs crowd into your mind and take over. What if our bus goes off a cliff? What if we get lost? What if my house burns down while I'm away? What if everybody teases me? What if I throw up on the bus in front of everybody and it's embarrassing, et cetera? And all of those minds that they perceive are going to prevent them from doing that thing that could be fun. And you can see how much that could limit a child's ability to just function normally in life. The other thing that you might do differently if you're in a minefield is you're probably going to show a preference to step, if at all possible, to step where you have already stepped. Because anywhere you've already stepped is going to be infinitely safer than anywhere that you have not yet stepped. And so, of course, if you're really lucky in a minefield, what you can do is step where somebody else already steps for you. But <laughs> if you are alone, and let's say you went too far in one direction, and you have to backtrack, you're going to want to put your feet in the exact same place. And you see this in anxious children as well. The preference for the familiar, for the pattern and the repetition, and the aversion to change and to novelty, even for seemingly trivial and unimportant things. Just this week, a parent told me about how they painted their house and their child completely freaked out about the change. And they were like asking, why does that matter to them? Why should they care? But the point is, from an anxious person's perspective, it's, I don't know if things matter. I know what I know. I know the familiar thing. And everything else just feels like stepping in an unknown place in the minefield. And then I don't want it. And so it makes me upset. Now, um, having said all of that, I want to talk with you a little bit about treatment and or, or you know, what to, how we help anxious children to overcome these problems. And I'll say a little bit on some treatments that have been well established for quite a while, but mainly I'm going to focus on the role of parents. So before I get to parents, let me touch on two other treatments that have been very well established. And I also want to say, uh, I, maybe I should have said sooner, but I didn't, that if people have a question, I'm not gonna pause in the middle to, ask quest to answer questions because it's hard over Zoom to do it that way. But if people have a question, you can write that question in the chat. And I will try to leave some time at the end and do my best to answer at least some of the questions that people uh, have written. So I don't promise to be able to answer every single thing, but um, if you have a question, feel free to write it at any point. And then when, uh, when we get toward the end, I'll take some time to look over if people wrote questions and try to answer them. So what are some uh, ways of treating and overcoming anxiety? And I do want to say that it is possible to overcome anxiety. You know, the, the world is full of children who used to have an anxiety disorder, and now they don't have an anxiety disorder because they got help. In fact, in all of mental health, in all of psychology, psychiatry, there is no problem more treatable than anxiety. And that's a really important thing for people to know. We cannot completely eliminate the tendency to be anxious. And so a person who struggles with anxiety may continue to be a somewhat more anxious person than someone else. But 
we can overcome the serious anxiety disorder so that it's maybe you still have some anxiety in your life and everybody does, but it stops being this thing that is really impairing your functioning, that is really debilitating or really distressing. And that uh, happens very often. On the other hand, it's also important to know that anxiety disorders don't tend to just go away on their own. And that's an important thing as well. Sometimes, if you're the parent of a child who's struggling with anxiety, sometimes people will tell you well-intentioned advice that is not good advice. For example, it's just a phase. They're going to grow out of it. And it is possible that your child will grow out of an anxiety disorder, but it's more likely that they will not if they don't get help. There is not a tremendous amount of what we would call spontaneous remission, meaning the problem just going away. In more cases, if a child is anxious today and they get no help, they're going to be more anxious next year, not less anxious. Now, if you put those two things together, if, if these problems don't tend to just go away on their own, but they do respond well to treatment and better than any other problem in mental health, if you put the two things together, what you get is a really good argument for getting children help. So if you are the parent of a child that you think is coping with anxiety, talk to them about it. Talk to your pediatrician, talk to your school uh, teacher, or talk to a mental health provider and try to get them help because it's likely that they'll be able to do a lot better. But it's also likely that if you don't do anything, that the problem will persist. So two treatments that have been around for quite a while now and that have really good evidence from clinical trial research to support their efficacy are on the psychological side, cognitive behavioral therapy, and on the biological side, medications. So I'll say just a few words on each of these um, briefly. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is really the marriage of cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy. So if you go back several decades, 50 years or more, those were two separate things, but now they have become very uh, integrated, and we just talk about CBT as one treatment. And as the name suggests, CBT focuses on cognitions and on behavior, meaning on thoughts and on behavior. The cognitive side of CBT for anxiety focuses on teaching children to identify where their thoughts are tripping them up. What are the thoughts they have that the, their anxiety is distorting? Where is their anxiety lying to them or tricking them? Uh, for example, by making them believe the worst possible outcome is the only outcome, or by making them believe that they know what somebody else is thinking, even when they don't. Uh, like, you know, an anxious child is at the mall, and they wave to somebody, and that person doesn't wave back, that child with anxiety is likely to, to assume that person, you know, they didn't wave at me because they don't like me, because they're shunning me. Whereas, a person without anxiety might think there's other possibilities too, like maybe they didn't even see me, for example. And so the cognitive side of CBT teaches children to recognize the ways in which their thoughts are tripping them up and to challenge their anxious thoughts, to stand up to them, to ask questions like, how likely is that thing? What other possibilities do exist? How awful would it be if X, Y, or Z were to happen? Because a very powerful cognitive tendency in anxiety is the tendency toward cat catastrophization, meaning to make a catastrophe out of things, even when it isn't. So a child thinks, you know, I have a test tomorrow, and I don't feel like I'm going to excel. What if I don't get a good grade? And then if they're an anxious child, they start thinking, well, but if I don't get a good grade, then my average is going to suffer. And then if that happens, I'm not going to get into the right high school. And then I won't be able to go to a good college. And then I'm not going to have a good job, and I won't have a nice house, and I won't have a good family. And their mind has taken them 30, 40, 50 steps down this pathway that is really very remote from the specific thing that's happening in their life. Like I have a test tomorrow, which I haven't even failed at yet. But that's the way the anxious mind sort of works. And so in CBT, a child will learn to interrupt that process, to ask those questions, like how likely is it that I'm going to fail? Or, does it really mean that all of those other things are going to happen, et cetera? The B, the behavioral part of CBT for anxiety, focuses on exposure, meaning practicing doing the things 
that my anxiety usually stops me from doing. Uh, so for example, if you are, um, if you have a phobia of um, heights, exposure, this is a really simple example, exposure might mean practicing getting up on a ladder and looking out a window and crossing a bridge or going up on the roof, things like that, safely, obviously. But um, pr basically practicing putting yourself into contact or proximity to those things that your fear usually makes you avoid. And that's really important because avoidance is so inherent to anxiety, right? Our, our anxiety system exists to promote avoidance. It's there to keep us safe by keeping us away from things that are dangerous. That's why we have an anxiety system. But when you have an anxiety disorder, you're staying away from things that are realistically not dangerous to you, but that you fear. And that means, A, that you're impaired because you can't function normally because you're staying away from those things. And B, it means that you're not having a chance to learn that those things actually could be safe for you because you're never doing them, right? So if you imagine a child with a fear of elevators, they have to go up to a high floor, they take the stairs, and then they get to the top and they think, oh, I got here safely because I took the stairs. And they're not having a chance to learn that the elevator could have been just as safe for them. And so the exposure counteracts that avoidance and desensitizes them to those uh, feared situations. And a third piece of CBT that's not um, part of this, like technically C or B, is, the, is to target the, physio the physiology of anxiety. Because anxiety affects our thoughts and our behavior and our feelings, but it also affects our body through those um, both short-term physiological responses, like the racing heart and sweaty palms, et cetera, but also through the longer-term effects of your body constantly being under stress, like we talked about uh, a little while ago, the wear and tear in the immune system, et cetera. And so children in CBT will often learn some tools for regulating the body, things like relaxing breathing, for example, things like muscle relaxation. And these are easy to teach, but they require that a child practice them a little bit in order to get good at them. It's not usually effective to come to a child who's in an intense moment of fear and try to teach them relaxation in that moment, because it, like, it doesn't connect. You know, if you were to imagine yourselves as parents, I'm assuming most people on the call are parents, and if you imagine yourself, let's say that you're you know, your, your, your kid didn't come home today from school and you don't know where they are. And you've called all their friends, nobody saw them. And the school says they left, but they didn't show up at home and you're freaking out. Imagine that I were to come up to you in that moment and say, now I want you to breathe really deeply, take a deep breath, relax. You'd probably not do that and want to punch me in the face because it doesn't connect with the way that you're feeling. And so, Similarly, when we want to teach children relaxation, we want to do that when they're calm and have them practice it, and then they can start to use that tool in moments when they are more anxious because if they've already gained the skill. So those are the key ingredients of CBT, are really that, that process of challenging the cognitions, working on the behavior through exposure, and um, working on the physiology through relaxation, breathing, muscle relaxation, et cetera. The other treatment that has been well established for quite a while now and also has a lot of support from research is medications. And I won't say a lot about medications um, here, but I, I will say that the, the frontline medications that are usually used are medications uh, that fall under the group SSRI. You may have encountered that. That's serotonergic med medications. It stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And um, these are medications like Prozac, essentially, and also many other names. And the most confusing thing to many parents, I think, is that they're not called anti-anxiety medications. They're actually called antidepressants. But that's not because they not used for anxiety, it's because they were used for depression first. And so they got the name antidepressant and that stuck. But it can be confusing to parents, especially because there are medications that are called anti-anxiety medications. And believe it or not, we usually don't recommend giving them for anxiety. 
especially in children. Those are medicines like the benzodiazepines, the Xanaxes, and you know, things like that. But the problem is that they tend to be more sedative, meaning they'll make you more sleepy. And they're a little bit habit forming and tolerance tends to build up. So you need bigger and bigger doses. And so we don't like to give them as a regular day-to-day -day medicine for, for kids with an anxiety disorder. And what we usually will use is the SSRIs, the Prozacs, uh, the so-called antidepressants. So if your child has anxiety and you went to the doctor and they prescribed an antidepressant, it's not because they're confused, it's because those are the medicines that are used for anxiety as well. Now, these treatments are effective, as I noted, but they're not effective for everybody. And so there's always room to do more. And here is where I really want to start talking more about the parent side of the equation, because parents actually have a really special role when it comes to child anxiety. And it's special, I mean, parents obviously have a role in any problem a child has, right? If your child has um, a sprained ankle, there's a role for you as the parent, right? If my child has a sprained ankle, I need to do some things. I need to take them to a doctor and get them, you know, treated. But that's because I'm their parent and I care about them, Right? And so any problem I would want to help them with. But the role of parents in anxiety goes way beyond that. It's not just that I happen to be the parent of a child and they have a problem, so I want to help them. It's actually a much deeper role when it comes to anxiety. And this slide with all these really pretty pictures introduces that because it's a slide showing uh, parent-child mammal pairs, pairs of mommy-child mammals. And of course, we also are mammals, human beings, and our basic mammalian biology, our basic mammalian nature, if you will, is really important for understanding the role of parents in relation to child anxiety. Why is that? Why does it matter that we're mammals? It matters because mammals are born not well prepared for life. Right? A young mammal that's born left to their own devices is not going to survive. They need help from someone else in order to survive. They need to be nourished and they need to be protected. I don't know if any of you have some uh, farming experience, but when a young calf, when a calf is born, when a cow gives birth and a calf is born, uh, do you know what the cow starts doing right away? It start, she, starts, she starts licking the calf. And why does she do that? Partly it's kind of bonding and soothing behavior, but also because in the wild, predators are very attracted to the smell of everything that comes out with a young, uh, with a newborn infant, because it signals, here's easy prey. And so the, the mother cow wants to eliminate that smell as quickly as she can. Now, uh, my point being, young mammals need protection from somebody else. And for that reason, when a young mammal is scared, when they are frightened, their response is meaningfully different from the response of an adult mammal, of a mature member of the species. You know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was walking from my office to my uh, car, and it, it was sort of a late evening, kind of like this one is going to be. And um, I was very mildly assaulted by a very drunk person. And it wasn't a serious thing. He just sort of was like swearing and shoved me. But in that moment, I had your classic fight or flight response. Like part of me wanted to sort of confront this person. And part of me wanted to get away from this person as quickly as I could. And that is a typical fight flight response for an adult human. But imagine a baby. Imagine that somebody came up to a baby and scared them. That baby can't do either of those things. They can't confront the threat because they're helpless. And they can't run away because they're helpless. So what would a young baby do if somebody were to scare them, if something were to trigger their anxiety? Well, the answer is simple. What the young baby would do is cry. 
right? They would get all red in the face, they would scrunch up their face, they would emit a very loud sound, they would cry. And that crying is a signal to their caregiver that they need help. It's a social behavior, an interpersonal social behavior. It's a signal to the caregiver that I need help from you because the baby is programmed and hardwired to know that they can't deal with threats on their own and they need help from somebody else. I don't encourage you to scare people's babies in order to test that theory, but you can take my word for it that that's what would happen if you do. And by the way, you also don't need to conduct your own experiment of scaring babies to figure out what happens when you do that, because as I'm about to show you in a very short clip from um, a very famous experiment, psychologists have already conducted for you the experiment of scaring babies in order to see how they respond. Um, and I'm referring to some very famous experiments that were done by a man named Harry Harlow many, many years ago now in Wisconsin. He was interested in studying the bond between babies and parents. And he studied it in our close relatives in monkeys. And when he wanted to see the baby responding to or behaving toward the mother, what did he do? He scared the little baby. Now, in this experiment that you're about to see a little clip from, the mother is not a real mother because Harlow took baby monkeys, separated them from their actual living biological mother, and raised them in a cage with these so-called surrogate mothers, like uh, they were dolls, essentially. But the baby became really attached to those dolls and saw it as a kind of parent figure. But take a look at what happens in this experiment. Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now, here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reaction to his mother are when we fight him. Scared, all right. And this is what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical object. This gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantal love. You can see it really vividly, right? This, this, because he's a monkey and not a human, he can't actually run, but he runs toward, like Harlow said, he's not just running away, he's running to his mother because contact with the mother helps him to feel safer. And Harlow ended that clip saying the words, this gives us part of the picture. And I don't know what he was referring to because the clip ends, but I agree that his experiment can only give us part of the picture. The part that it can't give is the parent's response. Because he used dolls, they had no response. That was just an inanimate object sitting there. But a real live mother would not just sit there frozen in response to a scared child. She would step in to provide crucial functions, to provide protection. And once the threat has been dealt with, or maybe she has ascertained that there isn't a real threat, she would provide regulation and soothing so that her child can go back to feeling calm and uh, relaxed. Meaning that anxiety, fear in young mammals, including primates, including human beings, is inherently an interpersonal phenomenon that involves both the child and the parent. And if you accept that, then you should also accept that if a child has a disorder, 
where the core of the disorder is chronic activation of their threat detection system, meaning they have an anxiety disorder, then what is going to ensue inevitably is chronic activation of that interpersonal system of signaling and responding involving both the child and the parent. That is why I say that the role of parents in child anxiety in particular goes way beyond just the fact that I care about this child and want to help them. Parents become almost inevitably drawn in to their child's anxiety symptoms through a process that we call accommodation. What accommodation really refers to is all of those changes that parents are making to, to, in their own behavior in order to help their child not feel anxious, to help them avoid or alleviate feelings of anxiety. And you can see that happening in, for just about any anxiety symptom. So for example, if a child has separation anxiety, they may be scared at night and the parent may accommodate by sleeping next to them at night. Or if the child has obsessive compulsive disorder, the parent may perform compulsive rituals together with the child. Or if a child has social anxiety, the parent may be speaking in place of them and, um, or, or not inviting people to their home because it would make the child uncomfortable. You, uh, accommodation, you can even see through those examples, it can be both an active and a passive behavior, meaning it could be something I'm doing extra or it could be something I'm refraining from doing, or I'm doing less of. Maybe I don't have the news on at home when my child is home because it's going to trigger their generalized anxiety worries, for example. Or another way that we'll sometimes carve up these accommodations is into participating in symptom-driven behaviors and modifying the family routines, schedules, timetables, etc. But really, it's all part of the general basket of accommodation. And we and many others have studied this issue of accommodation by parents intensely, and not just here in the US, but really all over the world. There's many, 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 many research studies on this, because it's increasingly seen as a very central component of what it means for a child to have an anxiety disorder. And what we see from all of this research is, first of all, that accommodation is by far the rule and not the exception. That's an understatement. In fact, across these many studies, between 97 and 100% of parents who have an anxious child report that they engage in frequent accommodation, usually daily accommodation, sometimes many times a day, of the child's anxiety symptoms. But we know more than that, not only that it's common, but also we know from the research that even though the accommodations are well-intentioned, right, they're, they are an attempt on the parent's side to help the child to feel better. And sometimes they're also aimed at trying to get through the day because you have to get to sleep on time, you have to get to work on time, to school on time. And so sometimes the accommodation is there to sort of smooth things over so that function can continue. But even though they are well-intentioned, accommodations are ultimately not helpful. Higher level of family accommodation consistently is linked to more severe anxiety over time. And so it might help in the moment to feel less anxious, but over time it maintains anxiety and tends to actually predict it getting worse rather than better. And it also predicts more impairment for the child and for the rest of the family. Um, maybe I can share with you an anecdote or two that like, can bring this to life a little bit. I, I, uh, one of them I know I shared also with uh, the school staff when we talked uh, like last week, uh, but I'll tell you as well. This is a story of a child that I met um, years ago who was about eight years old at the time. And he was suffering from a very strong fear of spiders. And in particular, he was terrified of the Black Widow spider. He didn't live near Black Widow spiders, but it was, he had just had this thought in his mind of this Black Widow spider coming into his bed at night and that it would bite him and he would die. And he was terrified of this. And so he did a lot of things to try to prevent it. He would search his room for spiders at night and he would keep a light on because they like the dark. 
and he would keep a window, his windows closed so a spider can't come in. But because he was an eight-year-old mammal, <laughs> child, he also had another belief. And this was the idea that the way for him to be safe and not get killed by a spider was for the very last thing that he saw, heard, or even thought about at night, for that very last thing to be his father saying to him, good night, son, and I love you very much. And he thought if that was the last thing in his mind before he fell asleep, he would be safe. Now, this, of course, doesn't make rational sense. Spiders don't care if your father loves you or not, but it makes emotional sense. It's, that, it's, it's like Harlow said, contact the mother drives away your fear. Your father saying to you, good night, son, and I love you, that's an attachment behavior that serves to reduce fear. And so when this child was going to sleep at night, he called his father into the room and he said, dad, can you say good night, son, and I love you very much? And his father said, of course, he felt good, in fact, in that moment. And he said, of course, good night, son, and I love you very much. And he walked out. But the problem was that it takes time to fall asleep. And pretty soon, another thought crept into the child's mind maybe even about the spider. So now it felt like it was ruined for him. So he called his father back into the room and he said, can you say it again? And his father said it again and walked out. And then he called him back. And then he said it again and he called him back. When I met this family, I asked them to count how many times are you actually saying good night, son, and I love you very much before your kid is finally asleep at night. And over seven nights until we met for another appointment, this father had averaged about 120 times every night. Now that's a solid two or three hours of saying good night, son, and I love you very much. And let me tell you, it might start out, you know, good night, son, and I love you very much. But when you're at 100 times, it doesn't sound like that anymore. Because these are three hours that you're not getting back, that you can't do anything else. You can't catch up on your work or have dinner with mom or, or help you, the sister with homework or do any of those other things because you're just pouring all this time into this accommodation of the child's anxiety. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The next night, the child is going to need 125 times. It just go, get, gets worse and worse. And you can see the impairment for the rest of the family too, right? Like the father's losing the time, the sister's not getting the help with the homework, and the child isn't getting to sleep. And finally, we also know that accommodation predicts worse treatment outcomes, both for CBT and for medications. So children who are more heavily accommodated at the start of treatment are less likely to benefit from the treatment if they do get it. And this is just a slide noting that we're also doing some uh, biological research using brain imaging to understand these accommodation patterns by scanning children in a, in a brain scanner, an MRI, an fMRI a brain scanner. And what we do is our version, I guess, of uh, Harlow's thing. We're showing the children uh, some pictures, some of which induce a certain amount of anxiety, like an angry face, not too terrible, but just enough to make a child a little bit anxious. And we scan them both when they're alone and when their mother is right next to them. And what we see is that when the parent is there holding the child's hand, there's a smaller brain response to the fearful image. And not only that, but children who have a bigger impact of the, of the mother's presence on their brain response are also the children who are relying most heavily on family accommodation, the children who are getting the most accommodation in day-to-day -day life. Now, all of that is to introduce a parent-based approach to helping children to overcome anxiety. Because what we have done is essentially to take these insights, this understanding of the interpersonal component of child anxiety that makes it different from adult anxiety, and the role of accommodation, and translate all of that into a parent-based treatment for overcoming anxiety in kids and in adolescents, uh, and we call this treatment SPACE, which stands for Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what goes into doing this treatment. And you can take these ideas and also implement them in 
yourself, even if you're not doing treatment, or you may want to work with a therapist who is you know, trained in it in order to have even closer guidance. But just understanding the principles can already give tools for how to approach all of those day-to-day -day situations with your anxious child. Now, parents in space learn is to make two kinds of changes in their own behavior in how they are responding to their anxious child. One of those is to become more supportive, to learn to respond to your child's distress in a supportive manner. And I'm going to, on the next slide, I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by a supportive manner. But that's one of the two really important changes that parents learn to make in space, is to be more supportive. The other change, is to reduce their accommodation, to systematically reduce or decrease the amount of accommodation that they are doing. So let me tell you a little bit more detail on each of those things. So I promise to say what I mean by a supportive response. And this is our recipe, if you will, for support in space. A parent is being supportive in response to their child's anxiety or their distress when they are communicating to the child two messages. And it's not support until you have both of those messages. The first is a message of acceptance. It's validating your child's distress. It's acknowledging their genuine difficulty. You can't be supportive if you can't acknowledge that your child is anxious. The second message, though, is a message of confidence. It's communicating to your child your belief that they can tolerate anxiety, that they can survive it, cope with it, and still be OK in the end. When you put those two messages together, that's when it becomes support. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be as simple as saying to your child something like, I get that this is hard for you. That's the acceptance. And I'm sure you can handle it. That's the confidence. And I would really recommend, if there's one thing to take from this talk, this whole like long thing this evening, it's this recipe for support. That's what I would say. If I could pick one thing that you'll remember, I would say take that recipe for support and try to implement that in the way you're responding to your child when they are anxious, by putting together that acceptance and confidence. And I emphasize it so much, because, partly because these two messages are not actually the way that many parents in intuitively respond. Sometimes we're not showing a lot of acceptance. Sometimes we're a little dismissive of children's anxiety. Maybe we want them to not be afraid, and so we tell them, well, don't be silly, or it's not scary, it's nothing. Or sometimes we're even a little bit harsher about it, like when we say, you know, grow up, don't be a baby, get it together, suck it up, you know, all of these kinds of uh, messages that don't acknowledge that for the child, this is genuinely distressing. They didn't choose to have an anxiety disorder or to have anxiety, but if they do, then we can start the support by simply acknowledging that this is hard for them. But the confidence piece is also not always there in the way that we are responding. In fact, a lot of children with anxiety will grow up explicitly hearing their parents describe them as a child who can't handle anxiety. Parents will say this, right? Like, my kid can't cope with stress. My kid falls apart. My goes to pieces. We can't handle anxiety. But think about it from the child's perspective. If, what, if the message you're being told about yourself is that you can't handle anxiety, what are you going to believe? You're going to believe that you can't handle anxiety. And that is almost definitely going to make you more anxious. Because the root of impairment in anxiety stems, the, the, the root is thinking I can't handle anxiety, right? If, let me tell you something about myself. I used to have a really strong fear of flying. And I still get nervous. I fly a lot, actually. <laughs> I fly a lot, but I, I still get nervous. But in the past, it was really bad. I would just be a, a, a mess on a plane. Unfortunately, I never stopped taking planes, and so um, I guess that's lucky. 
But when I got on a plane, by the time I got off, my whole body would just be achy because my muscles were so tense the whole time. And this, like, these thoughts are just running through my mind the whole time thinking about how we're going to crash. And the reason that I don't have a worse like, phobia today is that I was willing to experience that, right? I was willing to get on the plane and put myself through that really unpleasant experience because of the benefits of getting where I wanted to go. But if I believed that I couldn't handle it, right, if I thought I cannot cope with that experience, then I wouldn't get on the plane. And then I would be more impaired. And I would be more scared of flying today rather than less scared of flying. It's so important for an anxious child that we show them that they can handle that experience. This is the biggest gift that you can give to an anxious child is the belief that they can handle anxiety. I mean, think about it. If your child was diagnosed with a physical illness, right? Let's say they were diagnosed, and I hope they're not, but let's say they were diagnosed with diabetes or asthma or something like that, you would never sit that child down and tell them, it's a shame that you got diabetes because you can't handle diabetes. You're no good at diabetes, right? Nobody would say that. That's an awful message. And they wouldn't say it because they know the child has to handle it. They have no choice. And they want them to believe that they can cope. And it's the same with anxiety. If your child is vulnerable to anxiety, if they have that predisposition, that tendency to anxiety, then they're going to be dealing with some anxiety throughout their life. And the last thing you want them to think is that they can't handle it. And that's why the confidence piece is so important as well. And so when we put the two things together, the acceptance and the confidence, that's when we become supportive. And so I would say, think of a supportive statement that you can use, write it out for yourself, make sure it has the acceptance and the confidence, and then practice saying that to your child in those moments when they are anxious. And remember that confidence is not, you're not saying I'm confident about what you're going to do. You don't have to say, I'm sure you're going to do this thing or you're going to do that other thing. It's confidence that I believe you can handle anxiety and still be okay in the end. Now, working on reducing the accommodation is also really important. But my message isn't stop all of the accommodations all at once and never accommodate again. That's not really feasible, right? If you have a child with a lot of anxiety, there may be many accommodations that you're doing. And so take a much more systematic, gradual approach. Think of, first, take stock of the accommodations that you are doing. Sit down with each other, if it's two parents or with yourself, and try to think through your day. And think about, what are the things that I do differently with this child? Then I, what do I do differently because they have anxiety? Am I speaking in place of them? When we go to a restaurant, do I speak for them to the waiter, for example, because they have some social anxiety? Am I answering worried questions for this child throughout the day? Are they calling me frequently on the phone because they have anxiety? Am I coming home earlier from work than I otherwise would? Um, if they have obsessive compulsive disorder, am I doing anything because of that that is different? And really thinking through all of those different accommodations, and then having done that, my advice would be pick one thing. Just pick one thing. And for that one specific thing, make a plan for yourself for how you're going to do it less. You don't even have to stop at 100%. If you answer 50 worried questions for your child every day, you don't have to go to zero. Maybe you can go to five worried questions a day. So you're reducing the accommodation. And let your child know that you are making that change. Tell them in advance so that they're not surprised, they're not confused, and explain to them I don't think I'm helping you when I always speak for you or always answer those questions. And I know it's hard for you. Remember that recipe for support. And so put it in there also. I know it's hard for you, but I know that you can handle it. And I don't think it's helping you when I'm always doing that. And so from now on, this is my new plan. And don't be surprised if your child doesn't respond with gratitude on day one. Some children might get upset by this because they're anxious. They may say even something that's hard for you to hear. Like, you know, if you cared about me, you wouldn't make this plan or you, you, you would continue the accommodation. And they'll say that because they want to, you, to get you to do the thing 
that helps them to feel comfortable in the moment. But you'll be helping them to feel comfortable in the long term. And when it comes to treating anxiety, sometimes we have to, we have to uh, prioritize the slightly longer term. In the same way that if a child was doing cognitive behavioral therapy, we would ask them to reduce the avoidance. And that would be hard for them in the moment, right? Doing an exposure, like I talked about earlier, in cognitive behavioral therapy is really hard. You know, if you're scared of um, spiders, looking at a picture of a spider is really going to make you uncomfortable, right? It's going to be really hard for you. Earlier today, I was meeting with a patient of mine uh, who has what is technically called emetophobia, which is a phobia of vomit, of vomiting. And together, we watched movie scenes of people vomiting. And it turns out that if you go on YouTube, it's easy to find movie scenes. Somebody on YouTube took the time, and I don't know why, but somebody, but I thank them anyway, somebody on YouTube took the time to compile three hours worth of vomit scenes from movies. Now, we didn't watch all three hours today, but we watched a few minutes, and it was gross. I don't have emetophobia, and I still thought it was really, really gross. And for this child, it was a nightmare, right? It, it's like so uncomfortable. But you're prioritizing the longer term over the short term, right? You can do the avoidance, but then you're going to stay anxious. If you do the exposure, you're going to get less anxious. And it's the same with reducing the accommodation. You can do the accommodation, and it's like you know, putting a Band-Aid that will help them feel better in that moment, but they're going to stay anxious tonight and tomorrow and next week, etc. And so communicate that to the child, but don't be surprised if they get upset and don't get angry at them if they get upset, even if they get a little bit aggressive about it. Remember that aggression can be part of the anxious response too. You know, I, I, I think you all probably know the phrase fight or flight. So don't forget that half of that is fight, meaning our anxiety system can make us lash out sometimes when we're really scared. And remember that you're sort of changing something that they've come to rely on, but you're doing it to help them. It's an act of love, ultimately. You're doing it to help them because you care about them. And it turns out that when parents are able to make these two changes in a consistent manner, to be more supportive, and to be less accommodating, children get better. In fact, you don't have to go through these numbers, but I'm just showing it because it's data from a, ver from a large randomized control trial of child anxiety with over 120 seriously, severely anxious children. And they were randomly assigned to either a child-based treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, or a parent-based treatment, which was SPACE. And children whose parents made these changes of being more supportive and less accommodating were as likely to completely overcome their anxiety disorder as children who received direct therapy with a therapist, meaning you as parents have the power to help your child overcome anxiety. And I think that's a really important thing to know. It's really gratifying to help your child overcome a serious problem. And I want to be really clear that that doesn't mean that you caused the problem in the first place. I don't believe that parents are the cause of children's anxiety disorders in the vast majority of cases. Obviously, sometimes parents will behave in such atrocious ways that they will have a very detrimental impact on their child's mental health. If parents are neglectful or abusive, if you have maltreatment, those things are going to cause damage in a child. But that's not the story for the huge majority of children who have an anxiety disorder, right? That's the very small outlier cases. For the vast majority of cases, it's not because of you that your child has an anxiety disorder, but you can help them to overcome it. And those two things that I've been emphasizing, the support and the accommodation, increasing the support and reducing the accommodation are keys to helping your child to overcome anxiety. Um, in fact, by the way, you may remember that I said really briefly before that in our brain imaging research, we see that having the parent there has an impact on how the child's brain responds to fear. Well, we tested, and what we found was that if parents do this treatment with space, with the support and accommodation, that 
impact actually gets much smaller. And what it means is not that your child doesn't you know, care about you anymore. What it means is that they no longer need you to regulate their fear for them, even at the brain level, which is really remarkable. Like changes that you make as a parent can literally change how your child's brain responds and processes fear. And that's, that's a, a magical power for parents to, uh, to have. And so I'm going to leave, um, I'm going to leave time for questions, but I wanted to share this, some, the resource for learning more about this treatment for people who, who want to. There's a website that's dedicated to this treatment space, and on it, you can find a ton of information, including articles and videos and podcasts and things like that. And the website is spacetreatment.net spacetreatment.net. And if you go there, you can find a lot of information. And another thing that's on that website is a list of therapists who have trained in this treatment. So if you want to work with a therapist to do this work for your child, you go on the website and search by your you know, state and find uh, someone in your area and work with them. And everybody who's listed on that website has training in doing space. You can also work even on your own with this book that I'm showing on the slide as well, Breaking Free of Child Anxiety and OCD. Um, that's a book that came out this year that I wrote for parents to be able to do this on their own because listening to a one hour talk or two hour talk is, is great, but it's not, you know, we can't put everything into, into a talk like this. And so if, uh, if you read that book, you can actually work through the steps in a really methodological, like methodical, not methodological, in a really methodical way and systematic way with worksheets to accompany it, et cetera. And so I, um, I mean, at the risk of some conflict of interest, I really recommend that as well. And some people get the book and still work with a therapist, sort of working through the book together with a therapist. And that's a really cool way to do it um, as well. So um, I think what I'll, do maybe is pause here and see if there are questions that we can answer, that, that we can try to answer. Let me look in the chat. And if you have a question based on anything that we've been talking about, then go ahead and write it in the chat now. And then we'll see how we are with time. And if we want to do more or um, we'll see how it goes. So I'm, I'm going to look in the chat now and see if there are any questions. Uh, okay, I see a couple of questions already, and other people can still write your question now if you have them. So the first question was, how long does CBT take for most children? I understand it varies for every individual. So yes, uh, that's a good question. It does vary, of course, but typically a course of cognitive behavioral therapy will last somewhere between 10 and 20 sessions. Now, I realize that's like a you know, twofold range because 20 is double 10, but still it means we're talking about a couple to a few months worth of sessions. Um, maybe it'll be 12 sessions, 15 sessions, something like that. And if you're doing CBT with a skilled therapist, you should already see a change. You should see improvement even within, I would say, eight sessions. You might not be finished yet, but if you've done eight sessions of CBT with a therapist and it seems like there's no impact of it, mm, that's not a good sign, I would say. And maybe it's worth talking with the therapist about is there anything we should be doing differently or even consider working with somebody else. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. I see another question in the chat and that is, do you have a suggestion for a child who uses you for a sort of passive reassurance seeking. Like, I know if I ask you if this is okay and you don't respond, I still know it's okay because you tell me if it wasn't. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. It is, something that we, uh, it is something that we see a lot happening. It does happen because kids are clever. And so they're like, okay, if, you, you know, if you're not saying then. I'm... So what would I suggest? Um, what I would suggest is you come up with your supportive non-accommodating response. So maybe you say to the child, look, when you ask me things like that, I'm going to tell you, I know that your thought worries you, and I'm sure that you can handle it. And that's how I'm going to respond. And um, then just stick to that. Now, your child might still say, 
yeah, well, if you said that and not something else, then it means that things are okay. But that's, I would say to you, the parent, don't worry about that. Of course, it's true that if something were like a really serious problem that your child needed to know about it, you would tell them. But you know what? They know that whatever you do, right? If you answer, if you don't answer, they know that regardless. You stick to your supportive response and don't worry too much about the child who is saying that. And then um, another question is, hold on, what about children who don't have specific phobias or compulsions that you can use space for? They have more general overall anxiety. Well, um, in our clinical research, we have children with phobias, we have children with generalized worry, just kind of overall generalized anxiety. We have children with OCD as well. And so the answer would be yes, you can use space for a more generalized anxiety as well as the more specific phobias. In fact, truth of the matter is specific phobias are not the more common complaint in clinical settings. People often, even if they have a phobia, it's often not enough to get them into treatment, though sometimes it is. Whereas generalized anxiety is a very common thing that children are presenting for treatment for. So yes, you can use space for that. Um, another question. I have extremely introverted children who have social anxiety it's very, that is very hard for them. It's been hard to get them to connect with therapists and to open up. What do you, rec even those that they like and want to keep seeing, what do you recommend? Okay, so what I would say is a couple of things. Number one, don't force therapy. If it's, I mean, honestly, I, yeah, I'll, st I'll stand behind that. Don't force therapy because it's not going, if you're forcing it, it's not going to work. So ask your child whether they want to be in the treatment, whether they think it's helping them, et cetera. Now, if they do want to be going, but it feels like they're not opening up enough, then I would talk with the therapist about it. Meaning sometimes the therapist will say, look, I, I get it, you're right, the child's not so open yet, but give me time. Sometimes it takes kids time to open up, let's give it more time, et cetera. And I will probably listen to that advice at least for you know, some time. Other times the therapist might say, look, I'm trying, but your kid just won't talk to me and I don't know what to do. And in that case, it might not be all that valuable to continue. And so what would I do? I would probably, this may not surprise you at this point, I would probably be recommending a parent-based approach. When a child isn't able to benefit that much from child-based therapy, I would be recommending a parent-based approach like SPACE. Um, let me see if there's other questions in the chat. In your experience, can Prozac help de the depression symptoms and not the anxiety symptoms? Yes, that can happen. That can happen. Sometimes it's a question of dosages. Sometimes another medication might do better if there's a lot of anxiety and you know the depression has responded, but the anxiety hasn't. And sometimes adding a psychological therapy as well. But yes, it can happen that depression can improve when anxiety doesn't. Also, depression has a more coming and going course to it, meaning sometimes depression will lift even without treatment, whereas anxiety, as I said earlier, tends to stick around if it's not treated. Depression will sometimes lift even on its own. And so it's, you know, it might be the medication, it might not be the medication, but if a medication isn't doing its job well enough, then you should talk with the prescriber about trying something else. Uh, some more questions coming in. I don't promise to be able to get to all of them, but I'm going through as best I can. Um, how does this work when the parent is anxious too? Isn't the parent modeling the anxious behavior? Well, you know, if we developed a treatment for child anxiety that only worked for parents who aren't anxious, it would be of limited utility because a lot of anxious children are going to have anxious parents. And so, and by the way, when parents do this treatment, meaning space, we actually see improvement in the parent anxiety as well. That's not the goal of the treatment, but we actually, in our research, we see pretty consistently improvement in the parent anxiety as well. And so in a sense, you might say we're doing a little bit of treating the parent anxiety alongside it, because yes, you might be anxious and it might, you know, the question was like, how does it work? Sometimes we'll have to take it slower. Sometimes the steps will be even more gradual, but the thing with this treatment is that we're, we're, we're not just giving an idea, but we're giving really practical guidance. Like, here's the step, and we'll role play it with the parents, we'll practice it, and then they'll go home and they'll do that one specific thing. And even when parents are anxious, they're often able, 
for their child to make a change in how they're responding um, in those situations. What else? Um, what are you recommending differently post COVID and addressing social anxiety? How does a teenager get back past these hurdles presented this past year? You know, this is a really good question and I think we're all figuring this out a little bit as we go. Uh, I spent the first six months of COVID advocating in every platform possible through inter like you know, newspaper article stuff, whatever, interview, all this different thing, advocating for not letting COVID be a complete stop to children's social functioning. Because what I worried about and what has proven unfortunately true for many children is that it's very hard to bounce back from that. Now, um, if a child really has been more isolated over the time, I think what I would be saying is take small steps, try to do the small things first that they can do, meet with the one person, don't try to get them to go back to 100% of what they were doing before right away. And if a child needs professional help, then of course, get them that, uh, get them that professional help. And for your side as the parent, support and less accommodation. Um, is anxiety exacerbated in kids with ADHD? The answer is yes. And the ADHD to anxiety connection is strong and goes both ways. Meaning, if you have ADHD, that is likely to increase your anxiety, as the question uh, asked from Suzanne. But also the other way, if you are very anxious, that will affect your attention. You know, could you sit in a classroom and do a test if the classroom were filling with black smoke and your teacher just said, oh, don't worry about it, just do your test? Of course you couldn't. You would be incredibly distracted by that. And if you have an anxiety disorder and your mind is filling with that black smoke, then it's going to be harder for you to focus on what the teacher is saying or on you know, the work at hand. And so the anxiety ADHD connection actually goes in both directions. Um, thank you. This was actually, I appreciate your insights. I love, okay, that's not a question, but thank you to, I guess, uh, Christine for the feedback. <laughs> um, what can I do as a parent when I am stressed out and feel frustrated with my child's almost daily meltdowns? Well, first of all, I hear you. Uh, as the parent of three boys and uh, one of them a particularly <laughs> anxious slash angry <laughs> kind of kid, um, I definitely hear you. So first of all, let's be you know, realistic. We're human beings. You're not gonna always be perfect. You're gonna lose your temper sometimes. You're gonna be a little dysregulated yourself sometimes. You know, Be a little forgiving to yourself for that also because parents are just human beings who had children. We're not magical creatures. <laughs> and so you know, cut yourself a little bit of slack for that. The other thing I would say is uh, find the supports that you need. You don't it's not your job at every moment to, in, to downregulate your child's emotion. You, know, you can't always do that, and you don't have to always do that. If your child is having a meltdown, it's OK to say, if you st start feeling your belly tightening up and your neck getting hot, it's OK to say, all right, I see you're upset right now. I know you're going to be OK. I'm going to go in the other room now and go call a friend. Go take the dog for a walk. Go drink a cup of tea or coffee or what time is it? You know, bourbon. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to do when I get home. Uh, a cup might be an exaggeration. Um, you know, give, find the supports that you need. Take a time out for yourself. And you know what? A lot of times children's meltdown are going to end sooner if you're not sticking around to sort of calm them than if you do. So that's my, my answer to that. Um, Laura asks, is diagnosis the be-all and end-all? Can space help even without a diagnosis? Well, first of all, as I think you suspect, Laura, diagnoses are not the be-all and end-all. And let's face it, diagnoses in the field of mental health are really just made up things anyway. And what I mean by that is that all we're doing when we talk about diagnoses and mental health, and this is different from some other parts of medicine, but in mental health, when we talk about diagnoses, all we're doing is giving a, a, a name or a label 
to a set of observable symptoms or behaviors and deciding semi-arbitrarily whether they are serious enough to warrant our clinical attention or not, right? That's what, men, what diagnoses in mental health mean. They're not like, you know, doing an x-ray to actually test some underlying pathophysiology, right? This is because mental health is a new field of medicine. We are primitive. We're a few, you know, we're hundreds of years behind most other fields of medicine. Um, it's a bit of a digression maybe and more than you needed for your answer, but I really um, agree that they're not the people in all. The, I don't know if people know this, you know, like uh, diabetes, the name diabetes, what does it actually mean? It means, it's short for diabetes mellitus and it means sweet urine. And why am I mentioning that? Because a few hundred years ago, nobody understood why some people had some cluster of symptoms that looked like some chronic thirst and headaches and fainting and sweet urine. And so they didn't understand it, so they just called it, they just labeled it sweet urine. And they made the poor resident taste people's urine to find out if they had diabetes. True story, this is for real. Now, we in mental health are at the sweet urine phase, essentially, of diagnosis, right? We don't have a well-mapped out pathophysiology. Today, we understand diabetes better. We know that your pancreas isn't producing insulin, so it's not breaking down sugar, so you're basically poisoning your blood with sugar until you die. That's, and we can treat it by giving synthetic insulin. In mental health, all we're doing is saying sweet urine, right? You have, I mean, think how silly I sound. People come to me and they say, my child is always scared of separation. And I say, mm, I think you have separation anxiety. My child is scared in social situations. Oh, I think I have social phobia, right? Like it's, it's just labeling what we're saying. So I don't wanna, I don't think you should over fixate on diagnosis. Now your real question was, can space help even without a diagnosis? And the answer is yes. It doesn't, your child doesn't have to be diagnosed in order, if, they ha if, if they're coping with anxiety and you see that, then I, I would say these tools can be helpful. And if you can catch a child who has maybe sub-threshold symptoms, then maybe they're not reaching the level of diagnosis, you might be able to prevent it from reaching a level that would be diagnosable. The main purpose that diagnoses serve is to get insurance companies to pay for the treatment. But now I'm remembering that this talk is being recorded, and so I'm going to limit my comments on that to that. Um, how soon will it take to see some improvement if we use space? Well. If you're doing it with a therapist, like in a systematic, you're going every week, you're working through the treatment, uh, I would say similar to what I said with CBT, somewhere between six and 12 sessions, we should be, you know, by, when we do treatment, we usually do 12 sessions and we're done. Uh, and sometimes we need to do more than that, but that's not that long. And we'll start to see improvement like halfway through typically. Um, if you're working on your own, then it's harder for me to say, we're actually doing a clinical study right now um, comparing working every week with a therapist to actually just giving parents the book and only talking to them a few times over the course of the few months. But I don't, I guess I don't know as well. Um, okay, did I get through all the questions? Yes, we made it. So I don't see other questions at the moment. So I guess it's probably late enough that I'll <laughs> leave. Amy, what do you think? Leave it at that. I think that's right. If people want to reach out to you with follow-up questions, is there a good way for people to reach you? Um, so I would say a couple of things. It, it is possible to reach me. My now I'm going to regret this, but my email, <laughs> my email, I'm writing it in the chat. God help me. Um, so you can send me questions, and I'll try my best. <laughs> is what I will say. I'll try my best to uh, get back. But, you know, the other things that you can do, if you go on the website, the space website, there's a forum and you can post questions there and people can respond. And if you go on the Facebook page that's listed, you, you know, th there's a group for parents and you can post questions there. And so there's other resources aside from emailing me as well. Well, thank you so much, Holly, and thank you all who are still hanging with us at eight, you know, 8.35 at night on a Wednesday. Um, I hope you found this as valuable as I did, and I hope you all have a great rest of the night. Thank you again. All right. Thank you all very much again. Good night.